So my name is Lakshmi, and I wanted to talk to you today about uh, radiation safety concerns you need to think about while ordering a body CT. And my talk is really focused on adult imaging. So first, let's start out with a question. Get out your clickers. The risk of dying of cancer from a single CT of the abdomen and pelvis is A, greater than the risk of drowning, or B, less than the risk of drowning? I'll give you a few seconds. Oh, I think... Polling's closed, but we'll go ahead. It is B less than the risk of drowning. <laughs> so four people don't need to listen to this lecture. They can go out and grab a cup of coffee. I wanted to give you some background. Um, medical radiation exposure has increased dramatically over the past several years. From 1980 to 2006, the annual medical radiation exposure that adults receive in the US has increased sixfold, and CT scans are about half of that exposure. The use of CT has actually increased about 20-fold from 1980 to 2010. This article came out in 2007 in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it discussed how we, um, we need to be concerned about increasing cancer rates in the general population due to increased use of CT. And since then, this, the issue of medical radiation has been in the forefront in the media. I read the New York Times a lot, and every couple of months there's a new article discussing the risks of medical radiation. Are we giving ourselves cancer? This is something that our patients are very aware of, and both you as the ordering provider and I as a radiologist need to be able to address their concerns. So what kind of numbers are we talking about here? Well, the average adult in the U.S. gets about three millisieverts of background radiation a year and three millisieverts of medical radiation a year. And a millisievert is just a unit of radiation absorption. Now, um, so the total, about the total radiation dose uh, an adult in the U.S. receives is about six millisieverts. The, this radiation increases at increased elevation, so people living in Colorado or airline pilots get a higher radiation dose than this three background radiation. Most of the background radiation is from radon in our homes, and about half of the radiation from medical procedures um, is from CT. So what are some effective doses of common exams that we order? A CT of the abdomen and pelvis with oral and IV contrast has an average effective dose of about 10 millisieverts. A chest CT has an average dose of about 7. A mammogram and a chest x-ray both have doses of less than 0 0.5. And again, to put that in perspective, the average annual background dose that we all get just from sitting in this room um, is about three millisieverts a year. So how much of a risk is this to us? The Association of, Medical Physis of Physicists in Medicine put out a position statement a few years ago and they said that the risks of medical imaging at doses below 50 for one procedure or below 100 for multiple procedures over a short time period are too low to be detectable and may be non-existent. Predictions of hypothetical cancer incidents and deaths in patients, populations exposed to such low doses are highly speculative and should be discouraged. So the medical physicists whose job it is to study all of this say that the doses for most of these exams that we're talking about are so low that um, they may be non-existent. Well, how do we measure radiation dose? Uh, I gave you those numbers of 10 for CT abdomen, pelvis, and seven millisieverts for CT chest. Well, that is the effective dose that a patient of an average size would get from an exam. So what we do is we um, put this acrylic phantom through the scanner, um, and this phantom is the size of an average patient, and uh, the, the effective dose is the dose that a patient of that size would get on, for an exam. Well, we all know that patients come in many shapes and sizes. So the actual dose that a patient gets may vary up to 40% from the effective dose. There are ways of calculating how much dose that one particular person gets from a scan, but they're very, they're complex calculations. They're, um, they take a lot of time and they're not really feasible to do on a day-to-day -day basis for every patient. So the effective dose equivalent is really useful for comparing one exam to another or for QA purposes for when we maintain our scanners, but it's not a great measure of biologic harm to an individual person. Okay, so I've just given you two big, big disclaimers. I've said that the medical physicists tell us that the, do the risks of CT scans are so low for one exam that we shouldn't even speculate about them. And I've told you that the way we 
quote, radiation doses isn't that accurate when we're talking about one particular patient. So how do you take all of this into account and um, tell your patient what the risk of cancer is after a CT scan? Well, I think the easiest way to think about this is just thinking about, thinking about the risks of CT in comparison to the things that we do every day. So the baseline risk of dying from cancer is one in five. The additional risk of dying of cancer after one CT of the abdomen and pelvis is less than one in 1,000. So we have a 23% overall risk of dying of cancer. We have a 0.09% risk of drowning. The risk of dying of cancer from radon in our homes is 0.3%. From arsenic in our water is 0.1%. 1%, and the risk of dying of cancer after a CT of the abdomen and pelvis is less than 0.05%. Okay, so is this risk the same for all comers? No, it's not. This is a study that came out in 2009 from a group at UCSF, and they looked at common exams and um, the induction of cancers in different populations. So this graph shows how many scans it would take to do to, of CTs for PE to induce one cancer. So in 20-year-old women, we would have to scan 330 20-year-old women to, for one of them to get cancer. Whereas if we were scanning 20-year-old men, we would have to scan close to 900 men to get cancer. Um, and the number of scans we would have to do to induce one cancer increases as, uh, as age increases. So who is most at risk for cancer induction after radiation exposure? Younger patients and women. So these are the patients that we really need to um, consider whether CT is the best exam. And radiation-induced cancers typically occur uh, uh, at least 10 to 20 years after the radiation exposure. So this is not something we really need to worry about in more elderly patients. Okay, well I've told you that the risk of, of CT scanning is pretty low. What do we do to further decrease that risk? Well, there are a lot of campaigns by different radiology societies and primary care societies uh, about radiation safety and radiation education. These are just a few of them. We do a few things on the radiology side to decrease our dose. We have some improvements in scanner technology. There, there are some scanner parameters listed here that we do on our scanners here at UT um, that all decrease dose. One of them is called automatic tube current modulation. So in, in this patient, this patient is wider from side to side, so it takes more radiation to get through this patient from side to side than it does from front to back. So our scanners automatically just decrease the amount of dose, just turn it down as they're scanning the patient front to back, thereby decreasing the patient's total dose. What do we need to see? We train our techs to really include the areas of interest in the field of view. So if we're scanning the abdomen and pelvis, we really don't need to see half the chest. We do not need to see half the femurs. We train our techs to um, just limit the area that they're scanning to the area of interest. What can you do to re decrease this risk as the referring provider? The single most important thing you can do is order the best appropriate exam. I know you've heard about the ACR appropriateness criteria a few times today, and I'm gonna tell you about it some more because it's a great tool. Um, what we, we, we want you to order CT scans on patients who need them, but we, we want you to avoid ordering CTs on patients who you're looking for pathology for which MRI or ultrasound might be better, better exams. Consider your patient. If you have an elderly patient or a patient with multiple comorbidities, these are people who you don't really have to worry about as much to in, for radiation-induced malignancy. Whereas if you have younger patients, and particularly younger patients with chronic diseases who will need repeat imaging, such as patients with Crohn's, Crohn's disease, you really want to consider the risk versus benefit and alternative imaging procedures. Dr. Yoke is going to talk in a few minutes about MRI and its use. How do you order exams? Without contrast, with contrast, without and with contrast. I know when I was an intern, I would order everything without and with contrast because I didn't want to miss anything and I didn't want anyone to yell at me. And it was just, it was easier to press that button. In general, most, for most initial exams, we want to um, order exams with oral and IV contrast. That's the best diagnostic exam. Um, and for most initial indications, we really want to avoid ordering scans without and with contrast. CTs without and with contrast are really for specialized indications, like if we're evaluating focal liver lesions or focal renal lesions. Um, but 
in general, they're not, a, they, they're not a great initial test. They double the patient dose without adding a lot of diagnostic information. And if you're not sure, give us a call. That's what we're here for. What do you need to see? Do you need to see the, do you need to do a CT of the pelvis or can you get by with just a CT of the abdomen? Well, most of the time you do need both the CT of the abdomen and pelvis, especially if someone has um, unknown pathology or you're looking for the cause of their abdominal pain, you need to scan both the CT, you need to scan both the abdomen and pelvis. But say you're following up a renal lesion in someone who has a known, uh, a known lesion already, you may not need that CT of the pelvis and you can minimize the radiation field that way. Um, and multiphase exams are usually not necessary for an initial, an, an initial workup. The American College of Radiology came out a few years ago with some appropriateness cr criteria, which are evidence-based guidelines that help choose the best exam for a patient with a specific indication. This is the, this is the list of topics for the gastrointestinal section. They have, um, they have similar lists for all subspecialties. So you can pick your poison. If your patient has left lower quadrant pain, right lower quadrant pain, jaundice, and um, it goes through all the diagnostic tests and gives you options on what the best exam is. So this is for someone with right upper quadrant pain. It tells us that ultrasound is the most appropriate exam and has no radiation involved, whereas CTs without and with IV contrast has the least radiation and has, or has, it's the least appropriate and has the most radiation. I wanted to close with this. This is a patient who came in with abdominal pain. So the, uh, a KUB was ordered, and it's a very low dose exam, 0.6 millisieverts. We see a couple of dilated loops of bowel. We have no idea what's causing this patient's pain. We don't know what's causing this bowel dilation, and we really don't get a lot of information from this exam. The patient went on to have a CT, and we see that the patient has a small bowel obstruction secondary to active Crohn's disease with a stricture formation. And it's true that this exam is a much higher dose. This, is a, this dose is 16, 16 times higher than the KUB was. But we're also getting a lot more clinical information and can appropriately treat the patient with the CT exam. All right, I'm gonna close with a couple more questions. The risk of dying of cancer from a CT of the abdomen and pelvis is A, greater than, or B, less than the risk associated with radon exposure in the average US home? Uh-oh, <laughs> people taking naps during, after lunch. It is less than the risk associated with radon exposure. <laughs> All right, so this makes this slide extra important. A good resource for educating both yourself and the patients on radiology exams and radiation dose concerns is A, cancer.org, B, radiologyinfo.org, and C, cdc.gov. I got the perfect spread. <laughs> let's, uh, let's just hope it's the, it's the clicker and not my presentation. It's bradiologyinfo.org. So in conclusion, what we, what we want is for CTs to be ordered appropriately and when they're needed. The last thing we want is for a patient who needs a CT to be afraid of getting it because they're scared that the CT scan is going to give them cancer. CTs are a really useful tool for management, uh, for diagnosis and management of disease. The risks of radiation exposure are real, but they're small, and they're smaller than what a lot of the public thinks they are. Um, patients we particularly want to avoid overscanning are younger patients and women. And two really useful tools for educating both yourself and your patients are um, the ACR appropriateness criteria and radiologyinfo.org. Thank you all.